Ladies and gentlemen from Revolution Land, thank you for joining me and tuning in today with my guest, uh, Chris Granger, um, a dear friend and also uh, um, the wonderful CEO of IWC. And Thanks today, for having me. How are you, brother? I'm good, I'm good. Given the circumstances, as good as can be. How are you? Uh, I guess I'm kind of adjusting to the new normal. I, I was initially spending the day in a very unstructured way. I even had the odd breakfast negroni and that turned out horribly. And so I've yeah. reintegrated structure into my life. So wake up yeah, early, definitely. exercise, get shit done, you know, that kind of thing. We have tailored pajamas at least, so, you know, nobody will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And how are you? How's, are you are you Michelle Hauser at the moment? Yeah, so we're in Chaffazan, of course, so we, I, I split my time between a bit of uh, office time with the uh, core skeleton crew that is here, and, and, and obviously we try and keep everything nicely apart so that we have people at home and people here. And uh, yeah, okay. it's a new way of working for sure. I think I think it's going to be a new way of working for, for quite some time, unfortunately, but you know, this is the reality that we're in, and well, you know, I guess uh, it's, it's for us to make the best of it. In fact, it kind of reminds me of something. So in the 1930s, um, for the watch industry in general, it was a very turbulent time, right? There was a lot of economic up and downs. Um, there was a lot of political unrest. And in the 30s, the watch industry was struggling. And uh, IWC also was being faced with these various different challenges. And what I love about it was IW's, IWC's response to this was to be innovative, was to, to be ambitious. And what yeah. they, they, they came about with this, this project, which was, um, uh, provoked by two interesting Portuguese wholesalers from Lisbon, Rodrigo and Texeres, and they said, yeah. listen, we would like to order a watch for our market that has all of the characteristics of a marine chronometer, um, but is a wristwatch. And what I love about IWC was they created this kind of necessity to innovate, to create a watch for this market. Um, through this, a legend was born, which is the Portuguese. Yeah, absolutely. No, definitely. It's, it's it's exactly that also when you think about the fact, you know, when, when I look at it back from Jones's day, you know, that link between water and navigation and IWC has been really strong because he obviously crossing the Atlantic, massive adventure, H27, setting up uh, IWC right on the banks of the River Rhine, using the hydropower to transfer um, power directly to his watch factory, creating the first uh, centralized watch factory here in Switzerland. And then, of course, as you say, the um, precision of his pocket watch movements very quickly meaning that our pocket watches were used as deck observation watches on, on ships and boats everywhere on the planet. And then finally, as you say, uh, Rodriguez and Texera showing up and specifying marine chronometer precision wristwatches, which of course we could only do at that, those times when all well, the wristwatches were tiny art deco pieces um, by putting a, a pocket watch caliber into a wristwatch, um, which is incidentally the same diameter as a Portuguese Acronos at 40.5. Uh, and, and obviously first delivered uh, in February 1939, but, oh, oh, there we are, brilliant. But the, the interesting thing there is that the, the first of these never actually went to Portugal, and we're not quite sure why that is, but instead I think the first delivery was to a dealer in Odessa in Ukraine, and then for the first couple of years they went all over Europe, uh, until then only later on where they start being actually sold in Portugal, so still trying to work out what actually happened there. I think Michael had some, uh, um, some, or David had some, some interesting comments or related or theories related to the fact that, of course, you know, the first uh, series of Portuguese watches was started in 1939 and I think went up to 1944, uh, yeah. which were reference, uh, we're using the caliber 74. These watches yeah. were also being shipped in the middle of the Second World War, so it was uh, quite challenging to move these things around. <laughs> Probably not yeah. the same. Yeah. Like, like now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Except there were countries still open for business. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know what, I, what I, I think is remarkable about this is that the, um, the look of the watch is such an interesting one in that it's so modern, you know, and it's you so... Had one already. You, you had a revolution edition, so... <laughs> <laughs> but this watch is so cool and, you know, very much, I mean, you're, you're a much better a person to tell, tell me about this as an architect, but am I correct that this is sort of informed by, by Bauhaus and by this sort of form follows function language? Yeah, I think, you know, the interesting thing is when I look at the history of the 325, you know, there's been every single version of dial imaginable almost on these. I mean, we had everything from these very Baroque decorated hands and Roman mural, very, very classic, to the typical sort of Art Deco dials all the way to then very Bauhaus dials with also Bauhaus hands. Uh, and then that goes all the way, I think, when you look at the 325 in both its versions into the late 80s even, with only about, you know, 690 or something like that produced. 
Um, and there was really a, a great variety of tiles that were used. But for me personally, and that's why we pick this one time and again that we're showing on screen, that really defines the essence of the Portuguese DNA. You know, that's got that modernism in it, um, classic proportions, very, very balanced style, but that oversized, crisp look that really still gives it that pocket watch instrument look. And I think that is really uh, what a Portuguese should be like. And, and that's why this is sort of the, the watch of reference for us time again when we look at the 3 to 5. Amazing. What, what I think about, about it's incredible is that this is an icon, and you're right, there's only 690 pieces, and if I'm not mistaken, if, we, if it wasn't for a Swiss retailer named Gole, who in the 70s commissioned a few more of these, and I think at this point you were using the caliber 98, there would probably be quite a few less than 690, you know? Um, yeah. But it is this icon. So let's cut to 1993, during the, the anniversary of the brand, 125th anniversary of the brand, and um, the Jubilee watch emerges, and it is, in many ways, you know, a modern interpretation of, of the 325. Yeah, exactly. Tell us about that. I mean, what, what, that, what was the, the premise behind resurrecting this, this, uh, this iconic watch? Well, I think literally this was one of those uh, all-time classic IWC designs, and this was the emergence then around about that time where it actually turned into what was to become the Portuguese family. And I think all the design codes then were laid down that in the end then enabled the Portuguese chronograph to be launched in 98, first in the Rattrapont, of course, and later on that really uh, developed that in, in, entire family. And I think it, it makes that link between what was the 325 and the, the, the start of this, when it was neither called Portuguese nor was it called 325, and then later on the full family development that has really become one of the most recognized uh, designs in the watch industry, with that Portuguese chrono, which bears all those uh, hallmarks, but has introduced the functionality into the line of chronograph. And then later on, of course, you had the perpetual calendar being introduced to the Portuguese in 2003, which then started off the development of what I'd call the, the instrument Portuguese, the more, more complicated watches, uh, with obviously everything up to a, a skeletized uh, minute repeater back in 2003, four, when that was, you know, which was Good beautiful. Yes. Um, the regular minute repeater, all the different tourbillon versions that we've had over the years, and of course the perpetual calendar, perpetual calendar tourbillon uh, uh, complications on that. Yeah, you know, I, I think that what's great about the Portuguese is, is that in every reference and every complication that it entered, whether it was a chronograph, well, I guess it started with the Rotropont, then the chronograph, yeah. the, the perpetual calendar, whether it was the seven days power reserve, which I, I believe began in 2000 with the Portuguese 2000, yeah. it has Absolutely. become a modern icon, you know, and I, I can't think of any guy that, that's a serious watch collector who in some ways doesn't have a Portuguese or should have a Portuguese because... Yeah. It, yeah, and I think it, it's, you know, what is in the, the DNA there is, is something that I, is really close to my heart about IWC, and that is that, that you're looking at a, um, a modernism that is not an avant-garde modernism, but it's a modernism that is classically informed, classically proportioned, but still always feels contemporary. And this is, I think, what a, what a Portuguese should be. You know, it's not a, a radical break with the, the, the DNA of the line for the last 80 years, but it should always feel a modern watch, and, and that's... For us also, when we did the manufacturing center, that was always the kind of architecture that I was looking at at the time, is how do you create something which is not breaking with classic proportions, that's not breaking with this continuity, but that is essentially of the day and forward looking, rather than being a vintage celebration of watchmaking back in the 1930s. So that's, that's really where, where I see that the Portuguese sits in our portfolio, where it's, for example, on the, the pilots, you have many more references that are clearly historical referenced vintage pieces, so to speak, in, in terms of their storytelling as well. The Portuguese, we always said, is, is still a watch of today, even though it has this 80-year history. Well, I love that, and I think maybe we can get started with uh, your, your beautiful 2020 mm. watch, because it's a, it's a great expression of exactly what you're saying. You know, there are clearly mm. some iconic codes from the past, but there's a lot of modernity into it. And maybe we can get started with these uh, series of steel uh, Portuguese chronographs in these very um, fun colors as well. Two steel <laughs> ones, one in, a, one in kind of a burgundy and the other in a, in a beautiful green, and then a yeah. gold one. Blue, right? Yeah, this is our starboard and port side collection, right? green and red. So, <laughs> in terms of navigation terms, yeah. So this is the the Soliage Burgundy uh, version of the uh, stainless steel Portuguese Coral. Uh, it's actually we, we we see that on a lot of watches, the, the the Burgundy, and actually it's it's slightly different tone from what it looks like on the screen. But uh, the Burgundy being quite beautiful with the light reflections you have, and then of course at the moment also for the uh, for the dark green, what we call the racing green. Um, which is, is really a, a powerful combination, which already worked very well on the Pilot's Chrono, and which we're also bringing out as color animation on the Portuguese Chrono. And the idea is here to really have, over time, uh, different color editions of those that are not limited as such, 
uh, that will you know enter the collection for a certain period of time and, and just add that little bit of, uh, of difference also when you um, combine that with different colored straps you can generate quite a different look on a Portuguese chrono yeah, on that very very iconic design and there's a cool you use quite a lot of blue dials this year I guess uh, in reference to the water but uh, there's a cool rose gold one with a blue dial also with the solar yeah. pattern now, Chris. Yeah, exactly. So we're we're creating a, a boutique collection, um, and actually, it's, this um, will eventually be available on uh, woven calf leather straps. Um, but of course, uh, in the current situation with our, our suppliers, we have to first deliver this on a standard strap. But we will make the uh, woven calf available a little bit later. Here, the inspiration was really that nautical codes of basically the rope structure on, on deck combined with the um, five end gold cases and, and the blue dials. And we have this all the way through from a Portuguese chronograph to a seven day automatic, to both the perpetual calendars and to a range of complications um, that I'm sure we're gonna go into in a minute that are all in this particular color code and that are boutique exclusive. Very cool. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, the next watch, which is the Portuguese Automatic 40. Now that's yeah. actually quite a discreet size for a Portuguese, 40 mm, yes, that's actually 25 mm yeah. smaller than the original 325, uh, which I think yeah. is, kind of, is in keeping with today's kind of interest in things that are a little bit more dressy, a little bit more discreet, a little bit more sartorial, and would fit perfectly yeah. what you're wearing, for example. Exactly. I mean, this is something um, that, that I felt uh, was missing in the collection because we, we have the Portuguese Automatic 7 Days, which is a 42 millimeter, quite an instrument watch, 7 Days Power Reserve. And I felt that as an entire collection, we need to have something which is a 40 millimeter, slightly flatter automatic, which has that very classic 325 inspired dial code of small second at six o'clock before you have blue hands on the steel, uh, blue model, etc. And just to make sure that we have that entry, entry point to the collection uh, that complements then the chronograph and then the seven days automatic and then the o'clock chronograph on the, on the upper end of the spectrum. And really, I mean, what we're quite surprised with is this 40 millimeter size. It, it really still feels like a Portuguese on the wrist, but it is just that slightly more wearable than the 42 with a greater height on the seven days. So we do think that complements really the automatic offering very, very nicely. What I like about it though, is even if though you've got in 40.4, you're still using an in-house movement, 8,000 yeah. caliber with yeah. the Peloton, Peloton automatic winding system, which is, uh, you know, Albert Peloton's famous uh, automatic winding, super efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So you get a yeah. real, you know, you, this is a problem. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because again, this is one of those things that, that our new manufacturing has, has enabled us to do over the last couple of years. This is now an all in-house Portuguese line that features three different chronograph in-house movements in the same line. Right. And that is all sapphire glass case back with the exception of the Laureus, which of course is engraved uh, on the back. But all the rest of them, we have two automatics with the uh, 82 caliber and the 59 caliber automatics, uh, seven days uh, with all the complications on on top and then um, the 69 caliber in-house rock chronograph which is inside the Portuguese chrono the 89 flyback inside the yacht club and then the 59 handbar monopusher in the Laureus piece so three different chronograph that's amazing so Chris I'm looking at the Portuguese automatic 40 um, and I, I'm really liking these two steel watches with the contrasting numerals the one in gold and the one in particular the one with the blue hands and the blue numerals um, 8,000 caliber in-house movement with the peloton winding system um, am I correct that this is meant to be a little bit more of an accessible a watch for, for, say, a younger uh, customer? Yes, absolutely. So this is the new automatic uh, entry price point to the Portuguese at 7,500 7, Swiss francs, and that is positioned just below the Portuguese chronograph for the 69 caliber movement. Amazing. So, I mean, that's great. And I love the fact that you're trying to also make it a little bit more accessible. I think one of the key things for, you know, anything, anyone coming out of this period is going to be um, the whole idea about proposing value, right? I think people are yeah. still going to want to buy. I think people are still going to be excited to have timepieces. I'm actually really happy to have watches in self-isolation because it helps me start yeah. my day. But Absolutely. everyone's looking for a bit of a value proposition, I would say, you know? Yeah, it's, it's that. And it's also, I think there's always a sense for, for that uh, understated craftsmanship because for, for me, I think one of the key things here is that really it, it has told us a lot, this crisis is telling us a lot about globalization and the way we consume and the way we, we are connected today. I think it's really hit home the fact how close we are connected as a global community. But it also tells us is, is that there is a lasting value in things that are well made and that essentially are designed to last forever. And I think we're now looking at, at, at the world we're living today. I think it's a, it's a positive message to look at things that are made without uh, having circumnavigated the globe 13 times in the process. And, really having something which is designed to last and to be repaired and to be maintained rather than things that are being thrown away every couple of years and replaced. Uh, and I think this is a, a value proposition that is 
slightly different from other categories of products where you can say, look, I actually have something which brings me pleasure, which means something in my life, but which essentially I can also maintain and make part of my story for, for many, many years. And I think that's why uh, mechanical watchmaking in its understated form is, has actually quite a powerful message. I totally agree. I think that when people, we emerge from this, one of the key takeaways is going to be, you know, of course people still want to spend, of course they still are attracted to luxury, but I think one of the questions everyone will ask is what are the ethics represented by that category of product yeah. and also by a specific brand? And I think you're absolutely right. Mechanical watches will remain and, you know, have an amazing position as being, to me, one of the most ethical products in the world because first of all, they last forever. And second of all, they only consume the energy that's imparted upon them by the human being, either by yeah. winding or wearing them, you know? And I know for you, as probably the only CEO who's designed his own manufacture, for you also, the, the, how you impact your surroundings was very important to you, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's that, and it's also, I mean, it's the skills preservation, it's the jobs creation, it's the fact that we train our own watchmakers, that we train our own polytechnicians, and that those skills as well, the mechanical skills, are being maintained in society that otherwise are, are, are lost very quickly. You know, when I look today, even at, at uh, our teams in design, how quickly we've gone from the um, ability to create models, to draw freehand and all of that, to a purely computer-aided type of design. I think it's important to also still make sure that we as humans don't use the skills to basically make stuff, because the inventiveness is amazing. And, and when you look back, you know, today, I remember one of my first visits to um, the Mercedes Formula One team, they showed me an octagonal sphere with many other grid spheres locked inside from a 3D printer and told me that uh, this, the only way to create pod, um, products like that is in a 3D printing process. However, when you go back at the, the Green Vault in, in Dresden recently, I uh, visited Wilhelm over there, and you can see that they were creating these things carved from ivory freehand 350 years ago. You know, and they were doing that without CAD, freehand with a scalpel, you know, through the openings of the octagonal sphere and created six, seven spheres inside one another, completely locked but free moving. So it's not true that we can't do that without computers. We just, it's, it's a danger to lose the skills over time. And I think that's also something that we have to think about. Um, what are the skills we want to preserve? Still training young people in, in crafts and still being able to maintain that cultural asset as well. And at the same time, of course, as you say, making sure that the impact that we create with the products we're making is as low as possible. That starts from all the material sourcing to where do we make it, how do we make it, how much water do we use, how much electricity, and so on, and how maintainable and repairable is the product. And I think nobody's perfect in that, but step by step, we want to get to something that people can genuinely, genuinely enjoy and feel good about. I love that, exactly what you're saying. It was interesting, I was having a conversation with Jean-Claude Biber, and he said mm. one of the biggest issues facing the third millennium is that not all, but in large, a lot of the biggest companies and biggest groups are being run by people who learn their lessons from the 20th century. And one of the prevailing lessons that was very popular in the 20th century was to pursue profit, maximize profit with little concern for how you impact the human beings and for yeah. uh, in the environment. And I think that th this lesson, um, this, this is a fundamental change that's going to happen after we emerge from here. I think no longer will it be acceptable to do that, to exploit human beings, to exploit um, uh, the, the planet as well. And I, you know, I congratulate you guys on being very forward thinking and also being one of the first pioneers towards moving in that direction. So, bravo. Mm. Okay, Portuguese automatic with the 5,000 caliber, seven days uh, power reserve, now also in the Burgundy, which I, every time I look at it, it reminds me a bit of a Negroni, <laughs> and, and uh, the blue in the, uh, with the rose gold. Very cool. Lily, that's I love funny. that. It's really cool. So, so Chris, is this meant to um, also like, you know, appeal to the guy that already has a couple of the seven day power reserve ones, and he's like, you know what, I want to get the Burgundy one, or is it also meant to just broaden the appeal to a whole different demographic? No, absolutely. I think we, we've, we've seen quite a, a bit of uh, attraction on, on the Burgundy from the Lewis Hamilton uh, last year. And we, we, it's, it's something that, you know, the, these color tenants, you just get this over time. And we just want to make sure that we animate those lines as well with those colors that are particularly strong at the moment. And really, that is why the Burgundy and the Greens are, are coming. And then, of course, the blue dial here in the, in, the, in the red gold, which we haven't had before, and the rose gold, um, clearly uh, as part of that. Uh, boutique collection um, to complete uh, the lineup of the uh, 5,000 references. Amazing. Um, so let's transition from this to talk about one of the, the great living treasures in the horological world, uh, Mr. Yeah. Kirk Klaus. Uh, and Kirk Klaus is one of my favorite guys. Uh, yeah. He's surprisingly still a very strong drinker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and and had one of the uh, maybe the recipe. Uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I and I love his sort of like off the cuff responses to my questions. I remember when asking yeah. him about Ocean Two Thousand, I was like, "But I don't understand how how can you make a two thousand meter water resistant watch without a helium release valve?" And he said, "Well, why don't you just make it good enough the helium doesn't get in there to begin with?" And I was like, "Okay, that's a pretty good mic drop <laughs> for Kirk Clouds." <laughs> yes, it's, all, it's it's also this thing that especially when you're doing it live on stage, you you don't quite know what you're gonna get. You know? So I asked him once, you know, <laughs> why 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 back in the day he he decided to to join IWC as a watchmaker, and he literally sort of came back and said, "Well, I didn't really know what to do. That was the only job that was available, so much for it. You know, it was, it was around the corner from my house." So I was like, "Okay, amazing. <laughs> that is the reason." <laughs> <laughs> one of the incredible things I learned also that, that uh, Kirk Klaus was also one of the guys in charge of the Langa One project, which is for a different yeah. time to talk about, but what a, what a legend. Yeah, yeah. So many things that he's yeah. involved in. So, okay, so Kirk Klaus also created the world's first synchronized perpetual calendar, which is a mm. perpetual calendar where you can move all the information, uh, day, day, month, and in his case, originally a year as well, uh, backwards and forwards. I'm uh, no, sorry, back uh, forwards with a single crown. Now, yeah. Um, that became a movement that became synonymous with uh, IWC. It has been now used in many of your watches, and now it appears also in a smaller size Portuguese perpetual calendar. Yeah, calendar. correct. Yeah. This time without the digital date, the, the, the date display, but a really cool and kind of more discreet and subtle watch. Yeah, exactly. So I think uh, this, this goes exactly in the, in the same direction again, where we're trying to um, create a version of the perpetual calendar that has all the functionality and all the proportions of a Portuguese. Uh, but really uh, fills that gap where today maybe the annual calendar sits, but in a more wearable format because it's a 42 millimeter case. It's less high than the Portuguese uh, PPC 44, and it really is a, a slightly flatter, dressier version of the PPC. And that sits neatly between the seven days power reserve automatic and the big perpetual calendar, the calendar 44, and also comes in a steel version for the first time, which is this one here. Um, and actually, one of, one of the um, interesting little details I love about this watch is that moon disc, because we were trying to figure out how to get to a perfectly polished and 3D shaped moon uh, with that night sky and the star detail. And this is something where there's only a couple of different uh, techniques um, in the industry which are very, very tricky to apply. So one is you can do this through an electroplating uh, process where you build the moon up physically and then another version that's uh, around quite a bit is basically a sticker, but that's obviously not what we wanted to do. So we actually machined them from solid gold. So we actually machined the disc in-house wow. from solid gold. Then we polish the moon into its 3D shape and the stars. And then we temple pad print the night sky precisely in between the moons. You can imagine in between the stars. You can imagine the kind of precision you need to actually get the print to sit absolutely exactly between all the little uh, corners of the of the stars, uh, and this is now uh, the first time we're we're making them like that, uh, actually machined from a from a solid piece of gold. I love it. Um, I you know it's interesting. It's a completely different watch somehow um, with the we're, we're in a smaller size and with this sort of beautiful symmetry between just the three. Uh, counters that you have uh, for the different date displays. I love the subtle integration at nine o'clock, um, just on the bottom of that, that sub counter of the leap year indicator. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean this uh, in, in like the best way possible because it's so IWC, but there's kind of a paddock vibe to it as well, if, if I may say, you know, like, and when I say that, I mean, it feels like it has already, it's always existed. Yeah, I think but what, what I love about this one um, is that you have to really, you have to try this on your wrist because what it does, and, and, and that's the bit where it really convinced me, is the fact that it, it really feels like a Portuguese case on the wrist, even though it's markedly smaller than a normal perpetual calendar. Like it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proportion that feels instantly comfortable and that you would never say, oh, it's too small for a Portuguese at all, even though it's the 42. And that is, I think, where the, the balance really works with that 82 caliber uh, glass case back, a quick glass, full TPC module, and also now we've integrated actually in the date, um, in the date switch, we've integrated um, a new function whereby you can no longer desynchronize by accident um, the date and the moon oh. when you uh, set the watch. So this, there's a protection uh, um, function in, in this movement, which we're going to integrate into all the different movements, obviously, to work towards that, that uh, end goal of having a, a fully locked and synchronized mechanism that uh, cannot desynchronize at all. Fantastic. 
But that having been said, for those of you who are worried that the uh, larger size Portu uh, Portuguese perpetual calendar has disappeared, fear not, it's still there. If you are a hombre, a mucho machismo, as our, our friends in Ciara, for example, um, don't yeah. worry, there's still a large size watch for you. And now in this beautiful combination of rose gold with a blue soleil dial. Yes, uh, exactly. As you say, our friends at Ciara, this is exactly the, the, the type of product. So this is the... Uh, uh, five N gold uh, blue dial single moon version of the perpetual calendar 44 with that full full four digit year display in the boutique edition, and then we combine this mechanism also with the uh, tourbillon at 12 o'clock in one of the complications, and then also of course the chronograph tourbillon. Amazing. You know, let's go from there to um, a couple of these high complications which you have. Yep. Created. Absolutely. The yacht club. Um, so. Uh, I like very much this incredible uh, tourbillon chronograph, uh, sorry, tourbillon chronograph automatic uh, retrograde that you have created. I just, yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed, I'm amazed the way how you keep all those things in your head across 250 watch brands. That is quite something. No, this is cool. This is really cool. And it's, and it's, I love it because it's, there's a lot going on here, but the way that all everything's been integrated is very clear and very elegant. Yeah, so this is the, the 89 uh, flyback chronograph for the totalizer up at 12 o'clock, which basically in the chronograph reads like a regular clock face. So uh, as it's displayed there with nine minutes past 10, that means nine hours, uh, 10 hours and nine minutes stopping time. And then you have a, a flying tourbillon at 12 o'clock using uh, a diamond shell technology on the anchor wheel, which basically is uh, that nano coating, which ensures that the abrasion um, is absolutely minimal. It's got the retrograde dates uh, and, uh, and the don't uh, a glass which gives it that sort of classic uh, instrument look and then the open glass case bank with the 89 chronograph uh, movement with a solid gold rotor uh, showing on the back and that we do in 50 pieces in platinum and 50 pieces in the 5N gold with the blue dial uh, both versions available and am i correct that this tourbillon is also uh, is hacking meaning that you can stop the seconds yes yeah and tourbillon stop yes that's, that's really cool because uh, yeah. the majority, majority of you can't, uh, them can't, and I think it, it really fits in nicely with this. Yeah. Even in, if it's a complication, it still has, has the characteristics of a marine chronometer, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very that's why, you know, we, we clustered the collection sort of working tight a little bit into the icons, which is sort of the autos and the chronos, and then the instruments, which are the PPCs and the PPC complications, which really have that navigation inspiration of the nautical instrument for the rest, if you, if you will. Beautiful. And then uh, let's go to uh, the combination of two of the, the, big, the biggest complications around and one of which you're, well, actually two of which you're synonymous with. Um, yeah. So the perpetual calendar and the tourbillon in the Portuguese case of 45 ml. Exactly. This is actually, especially on the, on the woven calf strap, this is um, the piece that I wore most during the, the roadshow because it's just, it's absolutely stunning. The way that the tourbillons combined with the perpetual calendar, that soliage on the blue dial. So far, you remember we had this in uh, the, uh, enameled or in the lacquered dial in the, in the Jubilee collection, but I really think that this, this combination of the, 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 the rose gold together with the, uh, the blue dial really gives it quite a bit of punch. Um, and it's, it's just a, a beautiful instrument watch that makes quite a confident statement, yet it's not flashy, so it, it's just an absolute watchmaking marvel that you can look at for hours on end. That's absolutely stunning. I love the uh, architecture of your tourbillon as well. Uh, we should point out to everyone that that is in fact a flying tourbillon, which has no upper yep. pressure, so pretty badass, uh, on an automatic watch, 5,000 caliber, seven day power reserve watch. And I think when they came out with the original version of that, they had created this kind of cool optical illusion where there was, you know, kind of a background covering um, the escapement wheel and all that. So it just yep. looked as if the tourbillon was floating in space and it was kind of like a mysterious yeah. tourbillon. When you develop these, it's, it's always uh, striking to, to, you know, the way you work out actually what to do to the finishing to make it look really flying in the way you want. It's all about, you know, what are all the colors in the background and, you know, that camel that actually penetrates the dial and is the opening to the tourbillon. It's all about the finishing of the inside angles of that to make sure that you get this kind of mysterious uh, floaty look. But it's, it's an iterative process, you know. It's one of those things that, that uh, I always enjoy about designing watches is it works very different from other types of design you know, other types of design highly relying on renderings and the fact that the rendering will give you an almost exact representation of the finished item with yes. watches is fundamentally different you do a rendering gives you a concept direction but in the end you work with the, the physical product you know, there's no other way to create the, the details of a watch than doing it in the metal and, and that's something that uh, really makes watch design quite unique Absolutely spectacular. So let's um, transition from that to two Portuguese under the Yacht Club uh, designation. The first, yeah. the Moon and Tide. 
Please tell yes. us a little about this. Yeah, so this is a completely new function that, uh, again, I really enjoyed developing with the team. So it's the first time we actually have uh, the combination of a um, northern and southern hemisphere uh, cigar cutter double moon at the top, giving you the indication not just of the position of the moon for both hemispheres, but also uh, the leap and the spring tides. So that's the more or the less expressed high tides, depending on the gravitational pull between the sun, the moon and earth. Uh, so at the top, it will indicate whether we're in a, in a leap tide or a spring tide cycle. And then at the bottom, um, you adjust all these mechanisms on the same crown, on the single crown at, at three o'clock. Uh, you have the high tide, low tide indicator. So what you do there is for any given location on planet Earth, you set the high tide once to the correct time for high tide. And after mm -hmm. that, it will run infinitely on, on the corrected 12 hours and 24 minutes tide cycle and give you the high tide, low tide indication for your location which then, of course, you will reset when you, when you change location. But it's really that combination of the moon, the spring tide, neat tide indication, and the high tide, low tide indication in a stunning ocean going, uh, a red gold, a uh, five end gold case um, on that rubber uh, and textile inlay. It doesn't quite show on the rendering. It's, it's literally the, um, the rope texture that you have in the, uh, in the yacht ropes that sits on a, on a rubber uh, a strap with a folding glass, um, glass case back on that as well. And, that's just been the, uh, the beautiful talking piece of the New York Club line. Very cool. And then uh, for, let's transition from that to the last watch from the 2020 novelties for the moment, uh, the Yacht Club uh, Chrono. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So the Yacht Club Chrono is a third generation um, of the original Yacht Club launched in uh, 2010. And we had first a 45 millimeter version in, in generation one, with a very sort of typical Portuguese open uh, a dial and, and these, these uh, pushes that are sort of inspired by the nautical cleats and, and bollards and so on. Um, and then we had a second version uh, in 43 millimeters with quite different case proportions. And here we've come back to the original slender case proportions, very open dial in 44 millimeters. We've toned it down a little bit in terms of making the running second hand red and keeping the main stuff hand in the same color as the, uh, as the other hands and then for the first time in the sports elegant Portuguese chrono premium chrono line we have these on metal bracelets both in steel and in, in bicolor two-tone uh, and really um, thereby really completing that offering of the chronographs of the Portuguese by having the uh, metal on metal chronograph with a completely new designed uh, bracelet which comes with a fine adjustment system where you have the push button on the uh, clasp where you can release and, and uh, and shorten the, uh, the bracelet by five millimeters as you're wearing it, depending on how your wrists are feeling on the day. Um, but really, they're a very, very comfortable um, ergonomic version of the Yacht Club, obviously. Um, really suitable as a, a sports elegant watch and quite different from what you find in other product lines, really to complement that chronograph offering within RWC. Amazing. So Chris, you know, uh, when I was a, well, still, uh, you know, I, I'm a big movie fan, and, and when I was a young yeah. man, I saw this film. Uh, I'll, I'll describe it a bit to you, and you tell me if it sounds familiar. It's about a naval aviator, and you know he has trouble abiding by the rules. Uh, yeah. But he's so talented. He was a bit of a maverick. He? <laughs> he was a bit of a maverick. Yes, exactly. <laughs> hmm. So uh, I, I happen to to, to know um, from following the the Top Gun Maverick uh, Instagram page that their IWC uh, has created a watch um, for the film. Um, is it possible? Doesn't say that anywhere, way. <laughs> <laughs> IWC watches are featured in the film. We may have spotted one or two. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are you uh, disposed to, to be able to tell us anything about this or give us a hint? Now, as you know, the um, the, the launch of uh, of this movie has been postponed to the twenty third of December, and uh, so we all have to uh, to wait and see a teeny tiny bit longer for this one. I, I have the Averex Top Gun jacket, so uh, yes, I, yes, I shall wear that. My cowboy, absolutely, movie. and hopefully, I can't wait. You know, this is the thing, and I actually, it it struck me um, a couple of months ago in, in San Diego as well. I mean, I can maybe you can, but I cannot think of another movie that has not had a sequel since the 1980s, where the entire merchandising empire, although sadly unrelated to the official owners of the copyright. But the whole merchandising universe is as strong as Star Wars, even though um, there, there have been many, many Star Wars films in the meantime, but only ever one Top Gun. And I find that quite striking, you know, the power of the recognizability of both the patches, the flight suit, the jackets, and so on, over so many years is, is, is quite astonishing. 
Absolutely. Are you kidding me? If that, that Japanese manufacturer was to reissue with the Top Gun Maverick motorcycle from that movie, right? Yeah. They, they would yeah, ninja. Top, my father and my father in law actually had one in the shop, obviously not right. stick it up, but it's it's such an iconic bike and it's so eighties, you know, you gotta you gotta love that. It's so cool. <laughs> speaking of the 80s, I have to say the, uh, the, the rising values of IWCs from that era is very interesting. Yeah. I had Orel Box on the, um, on, uh, on the Zoom, at, at, I guess, last week. And I said to him, okay, you know, I was showing him different watches. We were just having a conversation about what's undervalued and has the potential to rise. And we discussed yeah. quite a lot of IWCs from the 80s, actually, as well. You know, both from the perspective of the skinny engineer with the Omani Crest that I, I yeah. had. Yeah. But also the um, the whole collaboration with Porsche design as well. I mean, those yeah. were amazing. Yeah. And all the stuff that you created, you know? Yeah, no, we're, we're rediscovering a lot of that as well in the Ocean 2000, you know, the beautiful titanium craftsmanship that you had in the cases. There, there is a, a, a treasures there to be discovered, for sure. Definitely in that, that era. Well, of course... Well, you know, I, this is what I always wonder, you know, is there going to be a time where, where we suddenly think that from a watchmaking perspective, also the, the 90s are going to be cool? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe okay. moving on. Yes. They're starting to be already because if you look at like um, kids today, they're kind of emulating the grunge thing a little yeah, bit. Absolutely, absolutely. Nineties like rap now has become classic rap. So whether it's Wu Tang, yes. Biggie, or any of that stuff, you know, Public Enemy, like all of that stuff, uh, Nas, like all that stuff. I hate, you know, I hate to burst the bubble, but I was there in the nineties. It just wasn't cool. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yeah, I was a college student in the 90s. We just didn't shower very often. That's so so funny. <laughs> okay, actually, I should ask you two last questions then. Okay, first question is, um, how do you feel this time that we spent in isolation will shape or permanently change how we, and I think we talked about this earlier, how we regard the world as consumers and as human beings? Yeah. No, I do, I do think, as I, as I mentioned briefly before, I hope that if one thing comes out of this is the fact that we understand that as a, a global community, we see how directly we are connected to every corner of the world because the big problems are not affecting one country, one region, one religion, one political party or one state system. It affects absolutely everybody. And I think this was a powerful demonstration how something which in the beginning we can label as a local regional problem can immediately affect everybody. And suddenly we are actually calling doctors from countries that we've never called before who are giving us instructions how to deal with a pandemic we don't know how to deal with. And this is something that hopefully makes us realize that we have to stop or at least reduce the amount of, of nationalist, protectivist bickering and arguing about solutions to problems and genuinely work together on the big topics. Because all the, the, the beauty that comes with globalization in terms of information availability, the ability to travel, which I'm sure we're going to continue to enjoy, only works if we actually look after this planet together as well. And we finally realize that neither can you have uh, streaming borders for digital content, nor can you have borders for environmental topics, pandemic, health topics, and so on. And if anything, I do sincerely hope that uh, collaboration uh, across the globe will increase as a result of that. Because I'm also aware, you know, the human capacity to forget is, is quite remarkable. And I always think if this wasn't the case, we would never have a second child, ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> humanity would be extinct. Uh, so our capacity to forget pain and hardship is quite extraordinary. Um, so, you know, it, it, things will, will bounce back. I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced. But um, I, I do hope that we understand the connectedness of this plan a little bit better and start, uh, start working together. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, as always, inspiring, and I have to say, I absolutely love the new Portuguese family. A great extension. And I think it's a great reminder that the watch itself is a great reminder that at times that are, are, are filled with strife, um, innovation, art, and beauty always kind of rules the day and wins out. So thank you, and it, it was a Thank pleasure. you. Thanks, Wade. It's a pleasure. Thank you.